Happy Lord's Day! Praise God for another Sunday, another week of life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us sing praises to our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. When you lead me to the valley of vision, I can see you in the heights. And though my humbling wouldn't be my decision, it's here your glory shines so bright. So let me learn that the cross precedes the crown. To be low is to be high That the valley's where you make me more like Christ Let me find your grace in the valley Let me find your life in my death Let me find your joy in That you near with every breath in the valley. In the daytime there are stars in the heavens. see their radiant light. So let me learn that my losses are my gain. To be broken is to heal. That the valleys where your power is revealed. Let me find your grace in the valley. Let me find your life in my death. Let me find your joy in my sorrow, your wealth in my need, that you near with every breath. In Let me find your grace in the valley. Let me find your life in my death. Let me find your joy in my sorrow, your wealth in my need, that you need.
All things work for our good Though sometimes we can see how they could Struggles that break our hearts in two Sometimes blind us to the truth Our Father knows what's best for us His ways are not grows dim, and you just can't see Him, remember you're never alone. God is too wise to be mistaken, God is too good to be unkind, so when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, the master plan. He holds the future in His hands. So don't live like those who have no hope, for our hope is found in Him. He sees the present clearly, but He sees the first and the the tapestry is weaving you and me to someday be just like Him. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can trace His hand, trust His heart. He alone is faithful and true. He alone knows what is best for you. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. When you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. In the quiet of the song, as I kneel before you now, I believe your promise to be faithful. I don't always understand what your
There can be such sweet reward when we wait upon the Lord as we take the time He gives His perfect wisdom to be found in Him alone. All our deepest secrets known. We're surrounded by His grace when we seek His faith in Your presence. There is comfort in Your presence. There is peace when we seek. Find such blessed assurance in your holy presence, Lord. In your presence there is comfort. In your presence there is peace when we seek the Father's heart we will find such blessed assurance an ever open door to know our Savior more in the presence of the Father in heaven, we thank you for a new day. Lord, we come before you realizing so many are concerned and worried. But Lord, it's more important that we know that as your children, we are in your care, in your love, in your heart and mind. And we know that your word will always be our strength. We ask you to use your word to continue to strengthen us that we will not only stand firm and be able to speak out for, you, for others to know about you, that our life will truly mirror your love to those who are in need, to those who are filled with fear, and that only your word and you, you, bring, you uh, and the Holy Spirit can only uh, give our hearts the assurance and peace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Our scripture reading for today is found in Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth, between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, 
it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Good day to everyone. Can I ask you, is there anyone listening here who is born of the year of the metal, rat? Because according to a popular feng shui expert, 2020 should have been a very prosperous year for you. For some, it might have come true, but for the majority, you know, it's a joke. The expert couldn't predict the pandemic. 
Now, of course, we laugh when we hear of experts having wrong predictions like this. But do you ever wonder why fortune telling is so popular? My guess is that we want to take some of the fear and anxiety of the future away. Or we might even want the future information to better strategize our plans for our business, our family, even our relationships. But let me say this very directly. Biblical prophecy does not work this way. It is not meant to give us an advantage mainly on our own plans. There's a different function. In fact, do you know that God even directly condemns this kind of fortune telling in various places in the Bible, such as in Leviticus 19.31. Biblical prophecies may contain stuff about the future, but that is not its main function. The prophets were spokespersons. They just revealed what God wanted to reveal. And so sometimes the prophets spoke warnings or judgment or warnings about curses or encouragement when Israel needed it. So we need to be really listening well on what the prophecy is trying to tell us. Now, what is the function of Daniel's vision in this chapter? This was given during a time when Israel was already defeated. Talong -talo na talaga sila. They have been re repeatedly warned again and again uh, by God's prophets to obey God or else suffer the consequences. But they did not listen, and here they are suffering badly. They have been defeated, broken, scattered. And for such a broken people, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. I wonder if they could still imagine God's promises coming through for them. Maybe they might have looked at Babylon or Egypt or whatever world power and see it as the major thing of their times and see it as the major thing that influences them. They needed to hear God's encouragement and comfort. COVID-19 has brought the nations around the world to its knees. It is the major thing of our times. And I think just like Israel, the people today need to hear God's encouragement and comfort. Daniel was given a vision to help Israel persevere and keep serving and honoring God wherever they were in their exile. And I hope that today this prophecy also gives you a reason to keep persevering and hoping in God and serving God whatever your circumstances are, whether you are in a bad place right now or you're doing well or you're suffering unspeakable loss. I pray that this vision of Daniel will still speak to you. So we have finished the story or the narrative part of the book of Daniel. And so from chapter 7 onwards, we'll be talking about prophecies and visions. And I think people perk up when they think of, about you know, the end of the world, the, the visions of the future. The apocalypse is an interesting topic. And during the pandemic, I think more and more people have been interested. And these kinds of topics in theology we generally call eschatology. But my friends, today would not be a seminar on eschatology. I will be focusing on, I believe, something a bit more important than that for now. But that said, before we even get to the passage, I do want to say a few guidelines on how to interpret prophecy because it's important so that we get to hear and, and understand and interpret what Daniel is revealing for us. First, just so we're all on the same page, I believe we have to define what we mean by prophecy. If you read the prophetic books, only a portion of them are about the future. They are mainly about God's will, God's character, God's commands. It's about God. The prophets were spokespersons, like I said, and they sometimes gave warnings, they sometimes gave curses, they sometimes gave encouragement. The book of Daniel, at this point, is where God's people have been broken and defeated, and so it offers encouragement and hope and comfort. Additionally, when you read of prophecies in the Bible that talk about the future, specifically, you still have to determine whether it has already happened or will happen in the future, or a bit more confusingly, has already happened but will still have an ultimate fulfillment in the future. So you know, this is why it's so important to get credible sources, credible help when you try to interpret um, prophecies. 
you know, let's let's avoid just listening to random posts and videos and whatever okay, because we really need to be careful to come to conclusions too quickly from reading these prophecies because they need to there's a lot of background work that goes into it okay, they, there's not even general consensus among all the scholars so my point is there's actually a lot of room for mystery as we wait how God will fulfill his grand long plan for the world which leads me to my second point. Please do not believe anyone who, con who tries to convince you that they can predict the exact timing from the Bible when they unlock the secrets of the text. Now, Jesus himself warns us in Matthew 24:36 that no one except God knows the exact timing of his plans. There has been so many predictions in the past about the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus that a lot of teachers have already lost credibility. Whether it's 2011 or 2012 or now even the COVID pandemic being a sign of the end times. No one knows for sure. It is actually unbiblical to know the exact date because we cannot know it. And anyway, isn't it useless to know the exact dates? Think about this very carefully. What advantage would it give you beyond what the gospel of Jesus Christ already gives you? Whether it happens today or tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now, how could, can it possibly affect you? The role of the church is still going to be to honor God and to make disciples of all nations. You are still placed in your work, in your business, in your family, in your relationships to glorify God and to point people to Jesus. Our role never changes. In fact, not knowing the exact timing just makes, just makes everything more urgent because we can't know for sure. So please don't believe anyone who tells you that there's a secret that they can unlock from the Bible. Pang movies lang yon. Okay, no one knows the exact dates. What we can do is respond to what God wants to reveal to us through the prophets. And often, that is not the minor details. Because that leads me to my third guideline. You know, the specific elements, you know, details of each part of the prophecy is often not the most important for us to know right now. Okay, when it is given in numbers and symbols and, and vague images, then that means we are not meant to know right now. Although we will probably be able to recognize it as it happens. But right now, we cannot know it. For example, when you read of a terrible beast with horns or something that breathes fire, we're meant to feel this sense of, of horror and fear. But we don't need to know how to draw it. Right? There are some ideas in the Bible that, that we should be ready to fight for and indeed to die for, such as who God is. And what is his plan of salvation in Jesus Christ? Those ideas we hang on to. But there are some ideas that, that is just appropriate for discussion. I, there are things that are vague, and I don't believe we need to know it specifically right now. Okay, let me give you another example. I know during this time, I have heard of a lot of people being concerned about the mark of the beast and whether that mark is the COVID vaccine. Okay. They are they are in fear of getting the mark accidentally and being condemned by God. Now I understand that fear and, and that makes sense and of course we don't want that. But that is a mis misinterpretation of what is found in Revelations 13. Because what it reveals there is that the mark of the beast is given to those who worship the beast. It is not the other way around as if you can get the mark and then somehow be forced to worship the beast. The takeaway there is that don't worship the beast. There will come a time wherein it will be hard for the people of God to live because we will be forced to worship the beast. We will be forced to worship Satan. But we don't need to know exactly what that mark is because I don't think we will ever miss it when it happens. So, so that means this specific element of the prophecy is not important for us to know right now. So please don't get hung up on details. Okay, that, that might cause us to be, miss the big picture of what the prophecy is telling us. Okay, fourthly, 
I do want to emphasize this, that different interpretations of these elements of the prophecies are not a cause for fighting against each other, especially fellow believers. And I mention this because I have seen and I have heard and I know of people who are so passionate about this that they antagonize fellow believers who don't have the same view of them. Again, I repeat, there are some ideas that we should be ready to fight for. But sometimes the specific, the minor elements of the prophecies, you know, where is the Antichrist going to come from? What is the exact details of the ten horns of the beast that we, we see in, in chapter 7? No one knows for sure. That is vague. And so we can just be civil about it and discuss. Now, lastly, when we read of the prophecies that talk about the future and we see the elements that have come through, and I want to encourage everyone to allow ourselves to feel a moment of wonder and awe that God has been controlling everything, that God is sovereign, that what God has promised will happen. Sometimes we miss that sense. And it is meant to, to make us worship Him more, to enlarge our view of God, that what He said has come true. Now, I spend a lot of time with these guidelines because I believe it helps us put into context Daniel chapter 7. Now, this is a terrible vision. It's a scary vision. Now, even Daniel was anxious and afraid, as we see in verse 15 and 28. Now, I know it's, I said it's meant to comfort and encourage Israel, but it doesn't change the fact that what's going to happen is still terrible. In fact, what's happening at their time was horrible. And what is happening in our world today is still horrible. Even if we are in comfort, even if we are not experiencing such a terrible time, you know, just, just take a look around, around what is happening in the world and you know that this world is still going through terrible times. There are still beasts roaming about. And so this is a terrible vision. Now let me recap it. So Daniel dreamt of four horrible beasts who were given dominion and who were ravaging the earth. But at the end, God will judge them and take that dominion and give it to someone who looks like a man, but is more glorious. It's something more. And this son of man will rule a kingdom that will never end along with his saints. Now in that dream, Daniel, Daniel approached someone, most likely an angel of the Lord, to ask for the interpretation. Now I, I do want to mention this gives a hint that the, the, that the interpretations of the visuals never came from Daniel himself. It was always God who revealed it. And so this angel, this being, revealed uh, what it means. Now, the interpretation is not also super specific as to give, uh, I, as to give identities of every element of that prophecy, but we get a general picture of what God is going to do. For example, in verse 27, we know that at the end of world history, God is going to judge the nations, judge the world, and the Son of Man will rule a kingdom with His saints forever. And so that is the main thing in front of us as we tackle this prophecy. Now we'll try to answer though quickly who these four beasts are. Because it is interesting to know. Now this vision in chapter 7 is actually related to a vision that King Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. So that statue with the head of gold and different uh, metals in its body um, is related to this. But this vision has more um, detail. It still deals with the nation of Babylon and the empires that come after it. Now, there is various, there's room for various interpretations in this, but we generally have consensus about the identities of the beast. It gets harder and harder to interpret it as we get to the parts that have not yet happened. But in verse 17, we know for sure that these beasts refer to kingdoms. So the first beast, the lion, actually refers to Babylon. It is warlike and powerful and glorious, but it is humble, which is most likely a reference to how God has been humbling Nebuchadnezzar to the point that he was forced to acknowledge the glory and the majesty and the sovereignty of God. And after the lion comes the bear, which is most likely Medo-Persia. That part where one side is, is raised above the other could refer to 
Persia being the dominant side of that partnership, and that three ribs in its mouth could refer to the nations that it has swallowed up. The third beast, the leopard, is a fast beast, but with wings just emphasizes how unnaturally fast it is. It is likely Greece under Alexander the Great who conquered his empire at lightning speeds. The four heads of the leopard could re- well, it likely refers to Alexander's four generals, the Diadochi, who divided his kingdom after his death amongst themselves. Now, we, from the future, have the benefit of looking at this, and again, this doesn't it allow ourselves a, a moment of wonder that God has controlled everything. God's predictions come true. God controlled the nations in all their power and glory and pride. God was still controlling them. And note the image that was given in this prophecy. The dominion was given to the nations. God was still the one who controlled them. And it was taken from them. And it emphasizes how sovereign God is. Everything that is happening in the world is according to plan. Though admittedly, we do not understand why everything happens the way it happens, we are assured that God is in control. World history is being written by God. The fourth beast in the dream was um, a bit more special and more terrible. Uh, We generally believe this to be the Roman Empire. Now, admittedly, the details get a little harder to interpret here, especially since the empire is not existing anymore. Now, the ten horns here could refer to the Roman Empire being broken up into ten kingdoms after its fall, And we can also argue that the spirit and the philosophy of Rome lives on today in the general uh, West, quote-unquote. But we don't know for sure. But all we know is from verse 24 to 25, somehow, you know, something or someone will come out, uh, out of the Roman Empire and make war against God and his people. This is generally what we consider to be the Antichrist. Now, who is this person? Where does he come from? Honestly, we don't know for sure. There's really nothing we can do about this. And I don't think anyone will miss it when it finally comes true. So we know that in the future, the Antichrist will usher in an era of intense persecution against God's kingdom and God's saints. Now, I said this won't be a seminar on eschatology, so if you are interested on this, then please go ahead and do research. But again, I remind you, look for credible sources. Don't just believe random sources or videos from YouTube, um, Facebook, or Viber. No, check out who's saying it. Maybe look at different sites. I, I hope you enjoy researching it as well, but look at credible sources. Because today, there's a more important question I want us to tackle. It's actually easy to miss it when we are so hung up on the specific details of the prophecy, if we're so obsessed about the identities of the beast. And I believe it's a very important question. Who are the saints? Who are these saints that will rule God's kingdom with Jesus? Why do I ask this? Think about it. If you are not part of the saints, then isn't this vision entirely horrible for you? There's nothing good in this vision about someone who is not part of the saints. And that is a big part of what makes this vision um, terrible. Are you part of the saints? And I believe that's a very important question to ask. Now, at at Daniel's time, the, the gospel wasn't fully revealed yet. So he was probably thinking of Israel when he was looking at saints, when he imagined the saints. But now that we have the benefit of knowing how the plan unfolded, we know that those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are are going to be adopted as God's sons and daughters. We are grafted into the tree that is Israel. We are part of God's kingdom. So I believe that the saints mentioned here are those who put their trust in the Son of Man, Jesus. It's interesting to note that the Son of Man is the title that Jesus refers to himself the most in the Gospels. I believe this is important. Hear the word of the Lord from this prophecy. 
The world is a mess and people are doing terrible things. But someday, God will judge the nations and Jesus will come again and rule a kingdom that will never end. And these saints will be a part of that. The whole of world history is leading up to that point. Are you part of the saints? And I want you to hear the word from Romans 2, 3 to 4. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? What it tells us is that this time, this era we are in before Jesus comes again, is a time of God's forbearance and patience. And it is meant to give us time to repent and come to Him. Do not delay when you hear the word of the Lord. This is the time that we can respond to the gospel. But we have to come while there is still time. Hear the word from Second Peter 3, 9-10. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And again, this is a time for us to repent, to turn to God because the day of the Lord will come like a thief and no one will know when it comes. No one can prepare for it. So do not delay when you hear the gospel. Come to Jesus while there is still time. Do you know what we have in Jesus? We have forgiveness. We have amazing grace. The love of God is so overwhelming that we have everything and more that we need in Jesus. But we have to come while there is still time. And I believe that is one of the most important things we get from this prophecy. Come, be part of God's kingdom. Respond to the gospel while there is still time. Now, if we are already part of the saints, if we are already in Christ, we are part of God's kingdom, what other ways can we respond to this prophecy? What are the other implications in our life? Can I, can I suggest just three things? Okay, first, I think it's good to remember that we are part of God's kingdom so that we can put our trust in that instead of the kingdoms of the world. Are you frustrated with what's happening in our country? No, it's not a new thing. Um, no institution is, is perfect. And so we should not put our trust in a country, organization, or whatever institution more than we put our trust in the kingdom of God. Do you know that we are put in these institutions that we can glorify God and, and love people and bless people and make disciples wherever we go? But these institutions are not what saves us. But just because we are ultimately hoping in the kingdom of God does not mean that we don't care about what's happening all around us right now. Okay, that leads me to my second point. If we are part of God's kingdom, then we have to put the kingdom's agenda over our own agenda as well. You know, there's much that is wrong in the world. It is sad and frustrating sometimes to watch the news or to read the news because you see all the horror that is going on. And that is what happens when our institutions fail us because these institutions are full of sinners like us and we are making a mess of the world. And so we are put here to do God's work. We are put here to make um, disciples, to bless them, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. But that includes actions and that is not just merely words. And to do this, to put the kingdom agenda over our own, would surely entail a cost. Of course, we're for, if we're doing business, if we're working, if we have families, there's a cost. And, and I know uh, no one can preach to you what you should or should not do other than God. What is the kingdom's agenda? What is God, what, what does God want you to do where he placed you? Only God can do that. And there's a cost. But I believe what you, 
get what you have in Christ is more than that cost. And I know it's hard, but, but in Jesus, it literally means that we have what we need. So in the midst of all the evil in, in these institutions, we are meant to further God's agenda, not just ours. But you may be asking, I, I am in a season of suffering. What if I am down? What if I am hurting myself? You may be wondering, where do you get the strength to do all of this? And that leads me to my third point. You know, when we put our trust in the kingdom of God, and even when we are in a season of suffering and chaos, we have all we need in Christ. And I cannot re-emphasize that enough. No. In Christ, we have enough all that we need and more you know today today so many people have suffered some people have suffered more than others we don't understand why you know, people have had loss of income loss of um, opportunities there is mental health problems physical problems sickness some have lost loved ones and we don't understand exactly why all of that happens but I remind everyone that if we are part of the saints then you have a treasure you have Christ that nothing can take away, even if we die. If everything gets taken away from you, this cannot be. No one can take you out of the Father's hand. So if you are in a season of suffering, of chaos, then if we are in Christ, our hope is still in God's kingdom. It cannot be taken away from you. So remember this. I don't care if you have been in church for so long or if you're listening for the first time. One of the most important questions to answer is, are you part of the saints? Reflect on it. Think about it. But come to Jesus while there is still time. And if the world around you and you yourself are in chaos, then remember that if you are part of God's kingdom, you have a treasure nothing can take away from you. And that you are meant to honor and glorify Him and love people wherever God has placed you. God bless you. Here are some questions for reflection and discussion with other people. We talked about some minor details that are not worth fighting other believers about. But are there other things we may be holding on to? It may be doctrines or interpretations or whatnot that you think you need to be more graceful about, especially when relating to other people. Number two, since we know that Jesus will eventually rule, what are some situations, problems, or concerns you have right now that you think you can now better trust God for? And number three, and I want you to think about this in your own situation. What are concrete ways that you can start Honoring God and fulfilling the kingdom agenda where God has placed you. Can you guess what happened in the last 60 seconds online? One million people log on to Facebook. 3.8 million searches were made on Google. 4.5 million videos were viewed on YouTube. 347,000 users were scrolling on Instagram. That's a lot of activity. But how many of those people read a blog or watched a video that told them more about Jesus? Join us this May 22, Saturday, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. to learn more about digital evangelism and how to reach her family, friends, or even strangers in digital space. See the poster for registration details. Let us pray and receive the benediction. O oh Lord, thank you for what you have revealed to us through your word, and I'm praying that it would cause everyone who heard this to persevere and to honor you and to glorify you and to serve you wherever you have placed them. And now, may the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.